You are listening to the HB Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, Episode 3. In this episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, we are joined by World Goose Calling Champion and Director of Marketing for Higdon Outdoors, Kelly Powers, to talk about some of his competition calling. He shares some experiences from the outdoor industry and tells us about some of the new products that Higdon has to offer. Hang with us. We got a good one here. All right. Welcome to the show. I am Josh Palm, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Dan Harushka. Dan, how are you, sir? Pretty well. How are you doing? Doing well. You know, um, I'm excited because we've uh, got a great show coming up here and really excited to, to talk to Kelly. But, uh, you know, we've had the, the goose opener here in our in our neck of the woods and we were able to, you know, get out together. I was able to come up to Pennsylvania and hunt with you and uh, some of the guys. And, you know, we didn't have, a, you know, a bang up hunt, but we had a good hunt, I think. Yeah, uh, the birds didn't totally cooperate. And surprisingly, we didn't hear the amount of shooting that we thought we would for a nice opening day. Um, you know, we, we still scratched a few, but it, it wasn't quite what we were expecting for sure. Yeah. You know, it's, it's hard too, because the opening day has been such a great hunt on so many occasions in the past that you almost get unrealistic expectations as to what you, you know, what you hope for. We had a bunch of guys in the field. We were hunting an eight bird limit area. So we were really hoping to, to make an, a nice pile of birds. And, you know, we've talked about this in some of our, our past shows, but there just wasn't the pressure from the other fields that we expected. You know, the flight wasn't real good. We had a lot of fog. And when the birds got up, there wasn't really a lot of, a lot of shooting going on around us. So we didn't have that volley kind of helping us out. But, um, you know, and all in all, we had a good hunt and it was, uh, you know, just kind of good to scratch the itch and get back out there. And, you know, it's still, it's still early. We got a lot of, a lot of season left to go. Yeah. And I'll just, I can tack onto that. You know, the, we've been out of time again and, uh, you know, the scouting has been paying off. We get out there and the birds are there and we show up the next day and, and, uh, they're missing. So it's been a, a little, a little different. I don't know if it's the weather or some of the super bright moons that we have, but, um, you know, I did meet a new fella. He, he came up as we were unloading our decoys and asked, you know, if we were hunting that field and we're like, yes, we are. And if you'd like to join us, you know, unload your stuff and come on with us. So, uh, we met a new guy, a new friend and a, a new hunting partner. So that was, that was nice to interact with him. Yeah, that's always always good to make another friend, and uh, you, know, you can never have too many guns in the in the in the field with you. So, uh, all good stuff there to report from us here in the early season. But um, you know, this is a really important episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. You know, we're going to be joined uh, by Kelly Powers, who you know is just one of the best to ever do it when it comes to you know competition goose calling. Uh, he's been around the industry for a really long time. He's a wealth of knowledge, and. Uh, he, we're we're just really excited to talk with him and and just hear some of the things that he has to say about the waterfowl industry and competition calling, and some of the you know the products that he's involved with there at Higdon Outdoors and the, sort of the changes that they're going through. So, um, you know, we're really excited for this episode and and what we're going to bring to you guys. Yeah, you can't say really excited enough times. You know, he's the best of the best, and you know he's done things that no one else ever has. And you know, I'm I'm excited to to throw some questions his way. Okay, so like without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it, and uh, we're going to be joined by Kelly Powers. All right, we are now joined on the podcast by World Goose Calling Champion and Director of Marketing for Higdon Outdoors, Kelly Powers. Sir, how are you? I'm good. How are you guys? We're doing great. We're incredibly excited to have you on the show. Um, there's a ton of stuff that we want to get into with you. Um, but for those of, of those of those people listening to the show that may not be as familiar with you and your background, tell us a little bit about um, your your background in the outdoor industry, specifically, you know, your competition calling. Tell us a little bit how you got into competition calling and maybe talk to us a little bit about some of the people that have been the biggest influences in your calling career. Yeah, man, that's, uh, uh, of course, uh, kind of a, a, a short rundown. That's, uh, we could talk about that alone probably all night. Um, but I've definitely been blessed um, throughout um, my calling career and, and with a lot of influences that people have helped me out along the way. Uh, kind of to start to start off at the beginning, you know, uh, I was born and raised in Union City, Tennessee. It's a little small farming community here in northwest Tennessee, um, probably around 30 minutes from the Mississippi River and Roofflet Lake. 
uh, you know, waterfowling terms, you know, real foot is is, uh, is pretty huge for as far as a, a waterfowl mecca. Um, and then also to the east is the Tennessee River system, which is about another 45 minutes away. So I'm kind of smack dab right in the middle of waterfowl country. Um, and growing up around here, especially in a rural and, and farm uh, environment, you know, hunting is a way of life. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I can remember when I was a child and going, you know, goose hunting with my dad back when we got Canada geese. I don't wish, unfortunately, we don't get many uh, anymore, but, um, you know, going hunting with him and, and my two older brothers, uh, you know, like I said, it was a way of life. I mean, if, if you didn't go hunting one day, it was, it was almost looked upon as a sin. You know, uh, there were, there were times that you, you get made fun of and stuff like that. And ever since I guess I was, when I was about in eighth grade, um, was really, of course, I grew up hunting even when I was could barely walk and go with my dad and brothers. But when I was in eighth grade, started going just about all the time. Um, and I remember my, my freshman in high school, um, and I and I was able to drive. I had a, a I used to call a learner's permit back and forth from school. But you know, every every morning I would hunt and get to the blind at five thirty, and uh, be at school by seven forty five, and then leave school at three o'clock and be back in the duck line around three twenty. Um, and, you know, you do that 60 days a year, every single day. Um, and to this day, you know, like I say, it's, uh, that's, gosh, that's been 25 years ago and it's still, you know, really hasn't changed. Of course, when you add a, uh, a wife and, and kids in the mix, it does kind of hamper your plans just a little bit. But, uh, being blessed in this, like I said, a rural community and have hunting opportunities literally just a mile down the road. Um, you know, and, and, and great hunting is, is, I've been very, very fortunate. So, um, when I was in high school, about a senior in high school, I kind of uh, have always been a kind of had a competitive spirit, and I wanted to get involved in calling contests. Um, and really, the main reason is, is I, I wanted a career in the hunting industry. Um, as crazy as that sounds, being anything that I could do um, in the hunting industry, I was all for it. And I looked at it as a calling contest, maybe as a way and a, and a door that I could open up to, to try out that would actually. Uh, where I could, you know, introduce me to some of these company presidents and stuff like that in the hunting industry. Um, it's funny because I, I remember the conversation I had with my parents, you know, about it. Of course, they thought I was crazy, but I, I'll, I'll never forget. I said, you know, if I could ever be fortunate to, to win a big contest like the world or something, maybe maybe I could create a name for myself that I could go and knock on the door of a, of a company president in the outdoor industry and maybe get a job, you know, um, after college um, or even an internship during college. And and roughly about a year and a half later, that that dream came true. Um, like I said, I started calling contests in the uh, the summer of '97, and then really got into a big in '98. And in the fall of '99, uh, I won the World Goose. Uh, the following year, I won the World Goose Champion of Champions, uh, and then that unfortunately, you know, retires you from the World Goose call, Calling Contest. But uh, as far as goose calling contests, you know, as you guys are probably aware. Um, there are a lot of other independent contests that you can still call in and, and aren't necessarily retired from the sport. So um, I felt like from my career-wise and calling contests, I was at my best two, three, four, five years after I won the world uh, in a lot of other contests. And uh, I stayed actively involved in that until probably in the late, oh goodness, um, 2010, 2011, 12. And I'll, I'll still call in some meet that calling contests every now and then. Um, I still judge the uh, the World Goose events and help help uh, coordinate um, as far as uh, getting judges and on the planning committee for that. And uh, that's, that contest has obviously given me a lot, and I've tried to uh, put back as much as I can and, and help the sport grow. So um, that's kind of a rundown a little bit, I guess, kind of a crash course on uh, from where I'm from and how I got into the calling contest at least. Well, I'd have to say that's pretty impressive if uh... – you know, people can just look online, you know, check your name out and see all your accomplishments. And, you know, it, it's quite impressive there. Um, I'm going to skip a, a question we had written down, but I'm just going to go talk a little bit about your, your practice habits. You know, you said that um, pretty much about two years after you started calling is when you won the world. So talk about your practice habits. You know, how many, how many hours per day or week did you put, put into practice to accomplish being, you know, the best of the best? Well, that's that's uh, that's a good question. I, uh, starting out, I, I had a strong percussion background and music background. I was uh, I was really involved in percussion and drums growing up, um, and, and really into high school. Um, and when I got into calling contests, a lot of the things that I was kind of taught from a book necessarily with with percussion in school 
uh, carried over, you know, and really helped me um, involving, um, you know, calling. And, and I know that sounds crazy, but uh, hear me out where I'm going with this. Um, the first year I went to the world, uh, man, I didn't even, I mean, I just, I got killed. I, I, I didn't make the first cut. Uh, I can't remember how many callers were in, but uh, I was blowing a flute style call at the time. Um, and, and I watched, you know, in Eastern Maryland of kind of what was winning. And, you know, there was a couple particular callers there that were blowing short reduce calls. Back then, nobody blew short reduce calls in calling contests. Very rarely did it happen. But there were there was a couple guys that were blowing short reduce calls that were doing well, but it was a really powerful sound. It was very unique. You know, back then, short reduce were tuned really light and easy. And it was all that, you know, people used hunting for the most part. But from a contest standpoint, it was flutes. Well, I saw what was doing that what they were doing, and they were having some success with it. So when I left that, literally, I left Maryland that weekend, and I got back home, and and uh, I started off on a sheet of paper, um, and I literally wrote down every note that I could do on a goose call, and every note that I've heard as far as a, a goose make, um, and and literally tried to you know transform that to sheet music as if you were to write uh, write a song, whether it's playing guitar, playing piano, whatever it may be. So I literally wrote down, and, and in my own terminology, you look at it now, and it's kind of crazy the, the the words I was making up of this stuff, because there's never a, there's not a set standard for um, calling notes per se. You know, somebody may call it this type of mode, and the next guy may call it this type of mode, but there's never an actual standard that it that it's under. So I would write this stuff down, and I basically built a routine, taking these notes and plugging and plugging them in different areas. Um, and built a 90 second routine and I would start at the beginning um, and I would do the first, you know, five seconds and I would do it and do it over and over and over just those five seconds. And I go to the second five, 10 seconds. I would do that segment. Then I do another. So I built the whole routine and segments. Um, before a calling contest came, I would, like I said, I would just work on the segments and about a month before the contest would hit, then I would only then would I start putting the segments together. Uh, and then roughly around two weeks before the contest, uh, I would uh, put the full routine together and just blow routines, you know. And and the biggest thing in calling contests too, and this we can get off really on some in-depth uh, discussion on this, but um, you know whether you're blowing whether you have a trumpet or a saxophone or any kind of musical instrument, there are places in there that you take breaths, you know. And the more you disguise where you take a breath, the more appealing and the more flow that that has. Well, just like blowing a goose call, when you're the only one calling, um, where you take that breath or where that pause is, um, is, you know, it, the more you disguise that, the more flow that the overall routine will have. Um, so it was a part that I really, really spent a lot of time on of, of having specific areas that you take a breath. Um, unfortunately, with today, a lot of callers, um, they'll always go back to what we call a check goose. They'll go back to just one hawk. And they'll do it over and over. So they may go calling. Well, when they're turning that one check goose, they're taking a breath. So, you know, it's been a really a pet peeve of mine to minimize that check goose, disguise when you take the breath. And then overall, the actual the actual uh, flow of your routine is more appealing. And it's just like a song. You know, um, you listen to a good song. The reason it's a good song is more than likely it has a, a good flow and a good rhythm. It's not necessarily erratic. You know, um, and it, it, the same goes for a routine in a, in a contest format. If it's appealing to the ears, because it probably has a good flow uh, that has, you know, obviously the right notes and the right tone, uh, but the flow is a, a big part. But as far as practicing in time, man, when, you, when you're when you in the, uh, you know, and, and some of these kids today are even younger than 16, but when you your lungs develop around 16, 17 years old, um, and when you start getting into, you know, adulthood there, you, your body develops to where you can create a lot more power with the call. Um, and you have a lot more energy as well, you know, meaning that there's not a lot of obstacles in the way. You don't necessarily have families that young as far as children. Um, and, and for me, I, I was in that same boat. I mean, it was just every single day, every minute of the day I was, I was calling and practicing and, um, you know, one thing that I can say from an advice standpoint is is practice smart. Don't a lot of people will pick up the call and the first thing they do in the call becomes habit. Meaning, every time they pick up the call, they do the same thing. Every, you know, they'll blow those first little sequence of notes, um, and that's kind of a bad habit to get into. What I would try to do is, when I picked up the call, I would only practice the actual segment that I was working on that particular time. So I tried to maximize my practice time and not go off go off on a tangent of just blowing a bunch of random notes. 
So, um, but you know, like I say, I would I would kind of live and die with the news call in my hands and uh, try to stay on task and and watch my uh, the time leading up to a contest. And then uh, if I kept my practice time to that schedule, I felt like when I got ready for a contest, I would kind of give it my best. You know, <clears throat> you touched on one of these things. Um how no one blew short recuse calls when you first got into it. And uh, you talked about some of the breathing techniques. What else has changed, um, you know, specifically with the calling competitions from, you know, when you got started to what you see now and when you're judging and that kind of thing, you know, what are some of the bigger, um, you know, other than what you've already mentioned, uh, anything else that you've seen kind of change and progress over the years? There's been some, there's been some good stuff and there's been some bad things uh, that I would say, I mean, uh, not, not, you know, overly bad, bad meaning, uh, some of the stuff that I dislike, a lot of callers try to do things they can't, meaning they try to go too fast, uh, and it shows weakness in calling. You know, if, if uh, they can go fast, go fast for a little bit and get out of it. A lot of these guys try to go all these crazy notes, and in reality, it does more harm to their routine than what it does good. As far as the good stuff that I've seen calling, uh, there's been a lot of creativity. Uh, there's been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of notes uh, that is, have, have, uh, you know, that have evolved, I guess, that are goosey notes, you know, um, spit notes, different types of moans, different type of trains and stuff like that. You know, there were variations back in, in my heyday of calling that we did stuff like that. Um, but now it's kind of evolved and a lot of guys are being really, really creative. I know the first spit note that I actually ever heard, and this uh, was probably, let me think, the year 99 or 2000, uh, I was actually in a goose pit with Alti Lanham and Adam Romana. And Adam, and these are just, of course, Alti is an incredible caller, so is Adam. But but uh, these are just are goose killers. I mean, incredible hunters, you know. And, and Adam was doing it, and I thought, man, this, that's incredible, you know. And I've never heard it at that time done it on, done it on stage before. And uh, that fall, uh, Alti Lanham used it as a signature note at the very end of his routine, and he ended up winning the, uh, the uh, Winchester World Open. Um, and that note was a strong, I would say, would be one of the main reasons that he won it because it turned a lot of heads as far as how creative and uh, how awesome it was. Um, I took a variation of that and actually extended it, uh, made it longer, kind of like in a train-style format. And it was funny because um, I, I used part of that in the world, Goose, and, and, and the year I won – and then after that, I was at a contest, and, and a, I won't, won't mention the area, but I had a, a judge that, that specifically just killed me for it. And, you know, and, he, and his exact words were, son, in 30 years of goose hunting, I've never heard a goose do that, you know, and, and as far as a spit note in a train, I was like, you know, I was like, oh, my God. And just, you know, I banged my head up against the wall because the number one biggest pet peeve for me is someone that says, I've never heard a goose do that. You know, their their range of vocabulary are, is is so far from the left and the right as far as what they do. You know, and I've heard a lot of geese that sound horrible, that, you know, were either sick or whatever. I'm not saying I would duplicate that, that on stage, but I, I would never say, well, I've never heard him do that, you know. But uh, my response to him was, well, for the betterment of the sport, I would love, and, and I have no disrespect, I would love to see you live audio uh, if you would entertain the idea. And he said, absolutely. So literally, I went back home, and I had some old cassette tapes from – um, actually, through Tim Brown gave me that from Paul Kenyon uh, that he had, and it literally I still have the cassette tape of live audio. I guess this was back in the 70s, 70s or 80s that he had, um, and I pulled some spit notes down and I basically re-recorded them onto a CD, mailed them to the to that specific judge, and uh, he called me afterwards and he said I stand corrected, you know. Um, so you know a lot of stuff is is evolved uh, like that, and uh, uh, definitely for the better of the sport. Um, one thing that one thing that Goose Calling has done that's really really well is it hasn't necessarily evolved into something that it hasn't evolved into notes that geese don't make if that makes sense. You know, duck calling from a contest standpoint, it has evolved into high balls and stuff like that. You know, I understand guys use that spin hunting, that's fine, but a duck doesn't do it. You know, and that's one of the reasons a lot of times I really never got into competition duck calling. I just um, I understand from a, from a hunting standpoint, um, some guys will do that. You know, I, I never do personally. Um, I hunt in timber most of the time. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of the old Phil Robertson says, if, if a duck can't win it, why would he want to call in it? You know, and, and I'm kind of the same mentality, and especially on, on a goose calling stuff. You know, the, um, the, the person that's closest to a goose that can do all the notes, you know, I think should, should win the contest. So, 
Well, I'll tell you one kind thing. My, my opinion on that. One thing that's definitely changed uh, since you started uh, calling is you'd be sending that guy a YouTube video or something. You wouldn't be ripping any cassette tapes down these days. Um. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> I remember, you know, taking, uh, you know, camcorders and all that and the great big shoulder fans and setting them up <laughs> and trying to learn. And now it's easy. It's easy for a caller to learn. I mean, they can go to a contest and, and record it with their cell phone and, and listen to YouTube, you know, and, and, uh, it's amazing how quick, and that's great. I mean, you know, the the um, you know the the year I won the world, the next year it was you know my father even went to a contest with me. It's like man, there were like four of you up there, you know, people you know copying notes, and that's fine, that's great, you know, because uh, I learned off other people ahead of me for sure, you know, and and it makes the sport better, and and it keeps it keeps if 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 you're considered. You know, if, if people are copying you, then I felt like I was doing something good at least. You know, they wanted to wanted to to you know, better their calling by listening to me. So uh, it is what it is there. Yeah, and with so much information out there now, and you know, I pull up YouTube and I watch competitions that people have recorded from all over the country, and I see some of the best callers in the country on you know just through YouTube browsing. Um, anybody out there that you see or you've seen that kind of reminds me of or reminds you of yourself? Uh, when you are, you know, uh, getting started or anybody sort of like a big name that you think might be coming up, somebody that you've been impressed with on the stage? You know, um, oh man, that's, that's, a good, that's actually a good question. From a personal standpoint and an ability standpoint, you know, Hunter Grounds is, is, is remarkable. You know, um, when Hunter's at his best, he's tough to beat. Um, and that's, and that's a fact. And, and, you know, I, I grew up, I mean, Hunter was, is like a little brother to me, you know, and, and grew up and, um, when they first started doing the, the two man world team events, you know, and, and, or just, you know, the two man contest used to be, it was all three man pits. You know, if you ever had a pin contest, it was, it was three callers. Uh, well, that kind of evolved into a, a two man and, uh, and I would call with Hunter. Um, and at the time you might've looked at it, we're kind of think, well, I don't want to say crazy, but you know, Hunter was 12 years old, you know, and he has that, he was still at that point to where he, he was an incredible caller, don't get me wrong, but he was at that point to where his body was developing and it was fixed. His lungs were getting, you know, more capacity and he was getting to where he could call with more power. But I, I saw the talent, man, and he had it. And I'm telling you, he was a monster, you know, and, and, and really now they're, you know, with him when he was calling and I kind of got out of the couldn't call of the world anymore, he was one that I would really try to try to help, you know, and, and there's nothing else I would rather do even than calling. And that would be to help someone else, especially that I saw that had the ability. And Hunter was one, man, I could say, hey, do it this way or do it that way. As ridiculous as it would sound or as difficult as it could be, he could nail it and he could pull it off. And that was something that, that, uh, he is remarkably talented, you know, and, and, uh, but it, you know, a lot of that evolves too. It gets to where, uh, you go from contest to contest. You may win one weekend and then the next contest is two months later and not do good at all. Uh, it has nothing necessarily to do with the judges. Uh, a lot of it has to do with, you know, uh, as a caller, you weren't necessarily prepared, not only prepared physically, but you weren't mentally prepared. Um, and, and I noticed that a lot with myself. I'd go to contests and I just, my head wasn't in the game, and I didn't didn't give it my best. And I knew I knew when I was on stage, you know, that uh, I just I just wasn't in it, you know. And and you lack in power, you lack in volume, um, and you're not paying attention to those little details of hiding breaths, your crescendos, your day crescendos. You're all, you know, all the way off the chart, you know. And and you couldn't necessarily uh, put that routine together like you practice, you know. Yeah, I li- I like the fact that you brought up how you how you helped Hunter, and like you said, he is absolutely amazing um you know and we we talk about not just helping people with calling but you know hunting get people out hunting and you know just it seems like sometimes waterfowlers are kind of to themselves and to their own fields and whatnot um and it's just cool that you know you talk about you know helping each other out and right now i'm gonna i'm gonna try and loosen it up a little bit and just ask uh you know you're around competition calling you've been around you know Tons of stages. Tell us about uh, an embarrassing moment that you've had on stage. Oh God, that's, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, well, I tell you, a potentially embarrassing moment. I uh, the U.S. Open in Stuttgart. Uh, the first year they had a U.S. Open. Um, actually, I was. I, I, let me kind of backtrack a little bit. Uh, I did a uh, the first time I ever did a spit note in a calling contest. I think it was at the. I can't remember. I can't remember what contest I, I was in. But anyway. Uh, anytime I uh, 
um, try to come up with new notes. You know, there's always a go-to person or a couple. You have your network of friends. And, and one of mine that, that man is, as I would do anything in the world of and highly respect is Brandon Fletcher. Um, not many people probably know of Brandon as far as current callers, but Brandon is, uh, I promise you, you put a call in his hands today, short read flute, doesn't matter. You give him two weeks to practice, and he's going to go out there and kick some butt. He's awesome. I mean, absolutely incredible, incredible hunter. Won the Winchester World Open. He's won the North American Masters, and he did it all in the flute days. But incredible, incredible caller. Wow. Well, I called him with the uh, the spit note idea, and, and this was right before the U.S. Open prep. And, and at the time, everybody was doing a spit note within just a short burst, just a real short, abrupt, you know, spit. And I said, Fletcher, there's more to this note than what a lot of people are doing. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, what if I extend it? I said, what if I extend it to more of a moan and a pleading sound as a cry? And he was like, oh, yeah. And then so we started talking. And he said, why don't you do a cluck behind it, like a double cluck? You know, the, you know, and I, so we were doing this over the phone. And then I said, well, let me quiver my hands, you know, and basically you take your off hand and you quiver it. And it, it just, it, the goose comes alive then, you know. And so we literally were doing this over the phone with him. And he's like, that's it, you nailed it. And I said, all right, that's my comeback. That's how I'm going to do my comeback uh, and, and try to, you know, you're trying to stay ahead of, ahead of all the other callers. Well, anyway, during the U.S. Open in Stuttgart, I lead into that. And the first round, I mean, I just, you know, nailed it. First round, whatever. And, and I go back behind the stage and, and a lot of the guys were, were, were laughing at me. They're like, dude, that is incredible, you know, whatever. Well, I think going into the final round, I was probably – I don't know, 10, 11 points in the lead. You know, and of course, I didn't know that until afterwards. Well, I go on the final round, and I go into that. And uh, right when I go into the, my comeback, um, and I was in the lead, but didn't know. I was going into my comeback, and I literally, I tried to do that spit note and quiver, and my hand was closed too much. And I just, the awfulest sound you've ever heard, you know, as far as it just, the call didn't lock up, but I just had to, it was more like a, a, a softer train, if that makes sense. And back then, yeah. guys weren't even doing trains. So, but it was just an, an off tone note. So as soon as I did that, it was like, all right, don't panic, boom, do it again, intentional, you know. And so I did it a second time, intentional. I did a cluck right after it. I did it a third time, intentional, you know, to mess up uh, whatever. And then I finished my routine. When I walked backstage, Richie, I'll never forget, Richie McKnight was just kind of had some choice words to say to me, and he said, "You sorry, sorry, dog." He said. You did that on purpose, didn't you? I said, well, the first time was an accident, but the second and third time I did it intentional because I'm trying to trick the judges to saying, no, this is what I needed to do, you know, and uh, ended up ended up winning the contest. And uh, and I had two of the judges come up afterwards and say, man, that last round, was that kind of a, a weird note or what was going on? And I just kind of laughed and they said, well, I heard you do it the first time and they were literally going to deduct a point or two, and they said, but then you did it again, and then you did it again. I was like, oh, that's kind of a goofy note. So, you know, so uh, I was a little embarrassed there at first, but I actually kind of tricked the judges, you know, and and, uh, and tried to force myself to make an incorrect note again, you know, and, and push my way through it and, and was able to uh, really disguise what would have been an obvious mistake if I just quit calling or whatever, you know. So that was kind of, could have been an embarrassing moment, but it actually turned out, you know, in my favor. <laughs> I think that goes a long way to show why you're one of the best. Uh, that's uh, I would probably just throw right. my call down and start crying. I mean, <laughs> out of panic, I'm sure. I'm always, <laughs> I'm always, and I told Hunter this, and I always told him, I said, you know, the best bit of, bit of advice I can give you, especially for someone with nerves, I said, I said, when you walk up stage for your warm-up, when they call caller number two, you know, come to the stage, please. I said, I'm dead serious. I said, trip on your own feet and fall flat on your face. <laughs> And I and, and Hunter laughed at me, and I said, seriously, because it can't get any worse than that from that point forward. And I said, if you've got to get the nerves, I said, you know, just recognize the crowd's not even there, you know, and and uh, use the stage for your advantage, you know, as far as where to face, how the judges are. Every every calling venue is different, indoors, outdoors. How many people are in the audience? Are the floors concrete? Are they carpet? Are they, you know, so many different things going to play. And, and through my calling career, I would I would write notes down and learn, you know, and okay, if I'm in this situation, I need to face this way. I need to face either the judges or I need to face it away from the judges because every little room that you were calling in, it had a, di a different acoustic effects. You know, things were different. And, uh, you know, you piece of those, put those pieces of the puzzle together and you find out what wins at certain loca you know, locations. That, and that's what you keep trying to do. And that's what I always tried to, you know, help Hunter with and, and some of the other guys that I help calling it, you know, and, and uh, go from there. So, you know, um, 
Kelly, we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna ask you one more question about about calling, and then we're gonna transition in, into some other things. But um, yeah, I've got a question for you that it might just be my personal perception. Um, and if, if I'm wrong on this, please correct me. But you know, I see online a lot and forums and things like that. Um, at times, I see quite a bit of animosity towards the competition callers and just competition calling in general. And you see a lot of people saying, well, I'm not interested in impressing judges. I just need to impress the birds and, um, you know, that sort of thing. And, you know, I'm not sure if it's jealousy or what it is, but, you know, I I look at a goose call, um, you know, and I think in no way am I comparing myself to you, but in the same vein that you do is that you're talking about your your percussion background, you know, the acoustics of your environment, all of those sort of things play into it like it's an instrument. And I, I liken it to if I was a guitar player, if I was a basic guitar player and all I could play was smoke on the water, I'd still look at people playing Stairway to Heaven and be incredibly impressed and wish that I had the command of the guitar like they do. So absolutely, I, I'm, I'm curious as to why, and may, again, if this is just my perception, I could be the only one that sees this, but you know, why do you think that there is that animosity towards someone who obviously you know, has incredible command of something that we all wish we could do? Um, you know, is that a perception that, that other people feel? And if so, um, I'd like to get your opinion on that. I, I You know, I, I no, I do see that, and I agree with where you're coming from with that. I do totally and, and see a lot. I don't see it on the goose calling side, me personally. Uh, I think where a lot of that comes from is the duck calling side. And, you know, to give those guys uh, some credit, duck calling has evolved to where guys are doing things on, on the stage for, on a Main Street routine that ducks don't do. They physically don't do a 40 note high ball. You know, so when, you know, and, and a lot of times people say, well, it's good for the sport, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, it, sometimes I could play devil's advocate and say, well, is it good for the sport? Meaning, if a non hunter that wants to get into hunting hears that, first thing he says, well, man, I think it doesn't sound like that. And if it turns him away from the sport, is it really good for the sport? You know, and, and I may take some heat from that for some comp- competition duck callers from that, but, that's my biggest pet peeve is when it's evolved. Now, I will say that with a disclaimer, most of your competition duck callers are incredibly skilled, and, and they're not doing that hunting, obviously. They're they're in there, you know, I, I don't want to be any day of the week, but from a perception of a non-hunter or a non-competition caller, when they see those guys do that on stage, nine times out of ten, they're thinking, man, I just, you know, I'm, that's not my cup of tea. You know, I just want to kill birds. I just, I just want to impress the ducks, not necessarily – press judges, you know. Um, I haven't necessarily heard that on the goose calling side. You know, most of the time on the goose calling stuff, every note that you're doing, goose, you know, on, on a stage, you could do out in the field. Not necessarily saying you would do it, but if you had to do it, it's in your bag of tricks, you know. So that's the, uh, to me, that's probably where some of that comes from. Um, and, you know, and I think a lot of that skill towards the duck. I really think the meat duck calling contest is where uh, – is is really really good and they're fun to watch. Uh, I think, and I honestly dare say you'd ask most of your contest callers. You know, um, they would prefer to call in a meat style contest than a, than a main street. You know, uh, the main street has such tight tolerances. Um, it, it's it's a different animal, man. It is a totally totally different contest. You know, and and I do highly respect you know the guys that have success on the stage to do that because. You know, they're having to blow, you know, three routines or maybe four if they're in a call off and, and be perfect each round. Um, but, you know, and, and pretty much you're having guys that all sound the same, you know, um, behind stage. And that's a tough, it's a tough gig to do. You know, it's not my, not my cup of tea necessarily, but um, I definitely see the talent uh, that they have, you know, um, as far as the ability to control the call and all that, but it's just not necessarily my cup of tea. And I could see where a non-hunter or non-competition caller would, it would kind of have a little negative taste in their mouth as far as contest callers per se. Yeah. I think that makes, I think that makes a ton of sense. And, um, you know, but I always just keep thinking, I mean, if a guy, you know, even if that's not a natural sound, the fact that he can control the call and make it make that sound, uh, you know, he can start, right. he can sit in my blind any day and I'll just put my calls away, you know? <laughs> so, uh, that's right. And I have, and you know, and I have, I've hunted with some guys that have been in the top 10 in the world duck. I mean, and great callers from a main street, but I'll be honest, you know, not good callers at all when it comes to hunting in the woods mm-hmm. at all. Uh, didn't understand control, didn't understand, I mean, way too loud on volume, trying to ring the call, you know, in a timber. And it's just like, hey, guys, come on, man, this, this is not, you know, 
when you're sitting on the X, best thing to do is, is not call much at all, you know, and you're calling it tails. And, and you know, so I, I've, I've seen both sides of it, you know, and, and me being a contest caller, I, I see guys that, and I've hunted with guys that, you know, uh, John Stevens, Jim Ronquist, that are incredible on stage. And you hunt with them in the woods, and I'm telling you, they're all duck, and they and they get it, you know. And and those are the guys that you know you think, man, okay, here we, you know, these are uh, that that's the ones I wish the people that that didn't understand contest calling, if they could be around more of those type of people, they would get it, they would understand. Say, oh, okay, I, I see you're you do competition calling because it makes you a better caller, you can control it, but the way you actually hunt, yeah, I want to be like you, you know. Yeah. I, I... We could talk about calling all day long with you, but unfortunately we got, you know, time we got to roll on. So, um, let's go ahead and talk about a little bit more, um, you know, what you kind of got going on more now. Um, you know, obviously, as we mentioned in the roll in director of marketing for Higdon outdoors, uh, you've got your, mm-hmm. your store catalog company, final flight outdoors. You're involved with under armor. Um, tell us some of, you know, about what you got going on and sort of, you know, the different, uh, things you're working. Yeah, well, I uh, of course I, I work for Higdon, um, Higdon Decoys, Higdon Outdoors. Uh, I'm the director of marketing. I, I help do with their website and uh, any kind of marketing ventures and and uh, help with product photography and anything to help you know promote their their you know our line of decoys and such. Um, and you know we've got a lot of great stuff on on the horizon, a lot of good products, you know. Uh, and and got a, really a great 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 looking product lineup. You know, obviously we make the the core decoys, but also getting the motion decoys and stuff like that as well. Um, also, I've been been a uh, I guess my turn with with him as an outdoor athlete with Under Armour, uh, and I've been on Chile with Under Armour. Gosh, off and on for um, actually right right when I was in college, I did some work with Under Armour right when they introduced the camo code gear. Uh, believe it or not, and uh, I when I um, I've, I've been right after when I graduated college, I had an employment opportunity with Drake, um, and I actually had to uh, uh, not do myself with Under Armour anymore, and I went to work with Drake Waterfowl as, as their director of marketing, and I worked with him for probably uh, four or five years and uh, until I went on board with Higdon, and when I did, uh, of course, Drake was starting to come out with some, some duck decoys and stuff, and, and uh, I went on and, and did the uh, 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 Under Armour. We started doing some more promotional work back with those guys again, and uh, been very fortunate and, and uh, very appreciative, and, and been able to learn along the ways with with good companies such as even with Drake and with with Higdon and, and uh, Under Armour. So we also have uh, I'm in partners with um, t- my two brothers with a, uh, a retail catalog, Final Flight Outfitters, and uh, we have a storefront here in Union City, Tennessee. And, Pretty much, we sell everything. We sell all the brands of uh, hunting products, um, whether it's it's big game, waterfowl, um, stuff like that. Um, and uh, you know, very fortunate with that. And uh, we try to make everything grow. You know, with my role with with our with our store and and what we do there. And then, like I say, I help with the promotions aspect with Under Armour, and and then keep and marketing stuff with Higby. And I've, I've been very blessed. You know, and uh, one thing one thing about it, this hunting industry is small and uh, the people you meet along the way, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm really indebted to, um, and and uh, a lot of the companies that I've worked with, and I've been very fortunate, I've made a lot of friends, uh, and, and still call friends, even the companies that I'm not necessarily um, working with, you know, anymore, just because I moved on to uh, with different companies, but the companies in the past, a lot of friends, and I'd like to say, no burnt bridges, hopefully, you know, so uh, uh, very very close, and, and hold them dear to my heart, and, and uh, very 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 good guys, so. And Kelly, you said that you you do all the uh, website stuff for Higdon. So tell us, just over the past couple of years, like you know, if you checked Higdon's website a couple of years ago compared to now, like it is just peppered with new product. Tell us a little about a little bit about the changes that Higdon has going on. Yeah, you know, well, of course, I, I obviously being from Tennessee, I'm a duck hunter at heart. And when I went to work for Higdon, they actually asked me if I would kind of head up their sales. And and uh, sales is not necessarily my my specialty, uh, but uh, so I assisted doing that. But I, my biggest thing at that time, Higdon was mostly known as a goose decoy company. And I, I said, guys, I, I'm a duck hunter at heart. We need to really beef up our duck line. Uh, so we we really got in. Uh, you know, neck deep into the duck decoys, and uh, now we have our uh, biggest for, biggest news for this year. We have our battleship line of duck decoys. You know, that are foam filled. We have the flock heads on the drapes. Um, very, very uh, popular and and a, a great item for us. Uh, we also redid our goose line, and we have the Alpha series. That's more of a uh, 
um, a life-size style full body huge decoy uh, with the flock heads, everything, and, and incredible paint detail. Uh, as far as the website, we're actually doing some a lot of cool stuff. We we, we have a partner with a media firm um, that's in our the hometown of our office is located, and and uh, they do it. They do commercials for all kind of big networks and stuff. Uh, just in, in the, in the media industry. And, and, and uh, basically the way it worked out, they kind of were looking for some office space and the owners of our company are friends with them. And, and uh, we went in and, and kind of did a partnership with them and, uh, they produced some incredible little commercials for our products. So we can do some really cool stuff as far as put, put, um, you know, goosey coins, like decoys or whatever on a, on a, a spin table. And we can actually do a 360 degree view of the products. And then we can we'll incorporate some um, in use footage as far as you know on the water in the field, uh, and we can basically put that down and edit that down to a uh, a uh, thirty second commercial. And the goal is is on our website to have those little little short clips for just about every product that we offer. So if you're a customer, you can go to the you know Alpha Goose Decoy page. And you can see not only your studio images and your field images of that product, you can also watch a video of it in a studio environment, you know, spinning 360 degrees to see every angle of the decoy, as well as in the field being used with some hunting footage as well. So that's been really cool as far as from a website standpoint. And uh, hopefully we're seeing a lot of a lot of good results from that. You know, it's funny that you mentioned the videos. I was just before we got we started chatting here. I was on uh, the website looking at some of the videos that they've done with some of the motion decoys that you guys offer, um, and they're just incredible. I mean, the some of the videos are just hard to imagine that they're actually decoys. It looks like a a really active uh, spread that that those that the capabilities of the decoys you guys have. So um, those videos yeah. are, are incredible. And Higgins, you know, Higgins is a unique company because you know we're obviously a decoy company. We we offer the with our line of decoys, we also offer motion decoys, you know, and, and, uh, the motion is a, is a big part of our business. Um, you know, Hayden's had motion products for years now. Um, you know, and, and, uh, we used to have the, uh, the flapper Canada goose and we still offer a version of that today. Um, and they used to have a, like a kind of a tram system with a lot of use decoys in the necks, you know, with feed. And that's back in the, goodness, that's back in the mid nineties that their father, Mark come up with And We don't offer that product anymore, but, it's a really evolved into the portable stuff, you know, and probably our best, best, most recognizable item in that is the pulsator, you know, where you have a, a mini 12 volt battery and a, and a portable battery box. So when you get to your hunting location that morning, you just, uh, you just plug it up and you literally chunk it, throw it out in the water and, and it'll shoot us. It's a feeding butt decoy. It'll shoot a spray of water every half second. And it does that four times on and off. And then it'll set idle for about eight seconds. So it's, it, it creates a ripple in the spread. If you need a quick hunt as far as a quick setup where you don't want to have to run a, a jerk cord, you know, um, the, the pulsators are incredible for motion, um, you know, to create ripple on the water. And you guys know you guys know how this is. You know, if, if you were able to fly over or get up in the air and look at water when it's set and still, especially decoys on water, um, you, you just it, it, everything looks dead. It looks like a graveyard. It looks like statues out there. Uh, but if you were able to create ripple, everything just comes to life, and, you know, especially, you know, so uh, that, that, that's a big thing. And that's where the pulsator is really, really helpful in those situations. So recently, um, you know, you mentioned when you came on board, it was primarily uh, goose decoys. And then for a while, there was a good bit of, um, you know, mallard decoys, uh, you know, on the site and that were offered by Higdon. And then this year with the Battleship Series, you guys have come out with a, a quite a few uh, sea duck or um, diver duck varieties. Uh, I think bluebills were the first ones to come out last year, um, but this year you've added um, uh, buffalo heads, golden eyes, uh, canvas backs, redheads, and um, not a diver duck, but uh, pintails as well. Talk a little bit about um, you know the thought process and the research that goes into the specific species that you decide to offer, because you know you'll see some companies out there offer you know every type of uh, bird that flies in the sky. It seems like. Um, you know, what are the, what are the thought processes and the discussions that kind of uh, happen behind the scenes to decide which decoys you guys are going to go into mass production with? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, a lot of it is, it is our own internal research and, and, and demand and, co- and consumer demand. You know, we, we, we listen to the calls, we listen to the criticism, we listen to the, you know, we read the emails, you know, and, uh, but we kind of get the vibe of what the, what the hunters are wanting. And, and let's face it, I mean, we're hunters ourselves. I mean, you know, all of us here at the office, we hunt. Uh, we're, we're doing, I mean, we do this, it, it's our passion, you know? Um, so 
we see that the diver stuff is was you know we're going to get into the duck line we have to have the diver decoys you know um, and we wanted to offer with the battleships we want to offer a premium you know uh, as far as the biggest the baddest as far as most durable uh, decoy we could possibly offer and that's kind of why we have you know have them in foam field and, and stuff like that so yeah, a lot of it's like I say, market market research. Yeah, you know, you're aware of what the consumers are wanting. Uh, you know, unfortunately, it's it's tough to manufacture specialty decoys that there's not a lot of use for. You know, as far as as far as 100 cent, but if there's not a lot of demand. It creates it tough to you know create the most of that product. You know, because the most can get pricey, they can get expensive, and the manufacturing costs can get expensive if you're not creating you know much quantity of that particular item. So it's it's one of those things that we kind of weigh the pros and cons, and uh, we try to build our line to where it's thorough. Because you know, if if you're a hunter, we want to. If, if you like our mallard decoys, we want you to obviously hunt over our diver duck decoys as well. So we try to create that full full line of of hunting products that you might need. You know, the the decoy market in general just seems to have you know just exploded with competition. It seems like every time I grab a you know, Cabela's or, you know, one of your final flight catalogs, it seems like there's a new manufacturer out there trying to do it different or a little bit better. Um, You know, tell us a little bit about some of the strategies that Higdon has employed to, you know, separate themselves and kind of differentiate themselves from just every other decoy that you see when you're flipping through the catalog. Yeah, you know, uh, we, there, there is. There, the decoy market's tough, you know, and, it, and it's saturated. And, and, and our competitors, and, I, and I'm just, just I'm, I'm overly honest with, with, with consumers and, and customers, you know, and even at our store. I, I tell them, you know, from, from Higman's standpoint, um, you know, there's our competitors make great products. There's no doubt. And, and as I told you guys, even before we went on the air, you know, there are products that we make that I wholeheartedly feel that, we have a leg up on, or, or I prefer this product or others. There are products that I think that, you know, well, we have a comparable product, or and then there's some that I say, oh, we're not necessarily there yet on this item if you're comparing it to something else that we might be beat at as far as in a competitor. So um, as far as what we try to do, you know, obviously you have to be real. Uh, I mean, you, you've got to be real, you know, and that's kind of that get real is kind of a slogan that we've used. It's on our website, and we kind of carry that tagline over to, to our thinking of how to develop products, but uh, your realism is at, at the most. Now, with that said, you know, from a Mallard decoy standpoint, sometimes over dramatization can be a little more effective from a hunting standpoint, meaning uh, me personally, I like my drakes a little lighter, and I like my hands a little darker uh, as far as color from the actual real thing. Um, if you fly, if you get up in the air, especially on a sunny day, and you were to fly over bodies of water with live ducks on, you, you primarily see two colors. Uh, you'll see whites and you see blacks. You know, if, if the sunlight is at your back and you're going, you know, what you're seeing as far as the whites is the side panels, you know, the side of, of, of your mallard drapes. Now, if the sun's at a different location, so the only thing, you know, only thing you're seeing is a black because it's the actual shadow part of the bird. So, with me, with our hen decoys, you know, you take a, a hen decoy that's just kind of painted brown and you place her on muddy water. When you fly over that spread, you can't see your hen decoys. They just disappear, you know, and even real hens, for that matter, too, they just they disappear on muddy water. So, you know, a lot of the, a lot of even the real foot hunters, they may kind of have a, a bad name as far as uh, appearance. You know, they used to hunt over a lot of the, the black jugs and people may frown on that and think, well, my, why in the world do you want to do it? Well, if you set set up beside a spread that has a thousand of these black jugs out, you'll see why. From a distance, ducks see that mass and they see that dark color, and it's like they have tunnel vision, and they will not look at any other spread. They will look at that one spread, key in and on it, and they'll end up shooting on those ducks. You could have the real thing out there and setting in your decoys, and, and they wouldn't pay you any attention. You know, and, and we see it a lot here, you know, around real foot as well, to where on a low water year, you'll have those lily pad stems and bonnets. You know, even even they'll, out in open water, you know, those lily pad stems will show up. And it's nothing but a but a decaying lily pad, basically, in a bonnet. But at a distance, ducks will bail out at that because it looks like a massive, massive duck sitting on the water. And then when they get into 50, 60 yards, they realize it's not actual ducks at all. You know, so that kind of goes in the philosophy of, you know, I like my drakes a little bit lighter on the backs. You know, not overly, overly white, you know, with that. But, but and I like my handy coys just painted a little darker so they'll show up better when they're sitting on muddy water. 
I think the the mindset that Higdon has of uh, you know always evolving, and you know the first time that you think that you're the top is the same time that you're going to get passed up, and you know knowing that you can always get better is you know just a great mindset as a company, and always you know working to be better. Um, what what can we expect from Higdon? You know any future plans? I don't know if you can release any info. You know what what else you got coming down the pipe? Well, I think I think what you'll see you'll you'll definitely see us uh, expanding on our on our death line some more. Uh, we do have some stuff we're doing there. We have some motion products that are just incredible uh, that we'll have out for 2015 for next year of uh, the spring. And you'll also see our 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 goose line expanded as well. And I I know that's kind of a blanket answer I gave you. Uh, but we do have some stuff that's really creative, some awesome stuff in the motion line that you guys will like. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's uh, like you said, you try to stay ahead, you know, but, but then again, you know, it, it's not, uh, there's, I mean, it's out there. The ideas are out there. You know, you just gotta, you just gotta be out mother nature. You gotta be out in the field every day to find them. Um, it's not recreating anything and you're just duplicating what's already been created and, you know, in real life. So uh, we just try to find those little niches and where we might can, can create a market or a little bit of a following and and uh, and offer that product. And, and let's face it, I mean, I'm I'm sitting in the blind looking for ways of uh, how I can be more successful tomorrow than I am today. And and uh, if it's designed a decoy this way or painted decoy this way, then we do it. And those ideas turn into actual products a year or two later. So um, that's how that's how the product ideas start. I mean, it's. It was. It's found in a, in a marsh, in a wood, in the woods, or in, in a in a goose pit, and and we it starts out from there, and and uh, works its way up to actual full scale production product. Kelly, where can uh, people go to find more information about Higdon products and uh, where to purchase? Well, you go to HigdonDecoys dot com um, and h i g d o n d e c o y s dot com. Uh, that's our website. Our products are sold in in. Uh, just about every major hunting retailer out there. Um, obviously, Cabela's, Gander Mountain Bass Pro, Max Prairie Wings, Final Flight Outfitters, Shields, Roger, I can go on down the list. Um, you know, if you have a local sporting goods store down the road from you, go check them out. If they don't have season, ask them that uh, if, if they would and, and, you know, look at carrying them. And, and uh, uh, the, the store buyer can uh, call Higdon and we can definitely set them up. Uh, we have a wonderful network of dealers throughout the country that we work with. And uh, without those guys, we couldn't. You know, we couldn't distribute the product so you guys could see it. And uh, I'm very, very fortunate to have them, you know, and, and you can go to our website, too, and, and look at what we have as well. And uh, like I say, try your local dealers. You know, for the most part, uh, you may have a dealer just, you know, 10, 15 miles down the road that you didn't realize that you can actually go, you know, that afternoon and, and put your hands on the product and see it with your own eye. Well, Kelly, you've, uh, we appreciate you spending some time with us here today, and um, you've given us just a ton of information. It's been an honor and a privilege to have you on the show, and uh, we'd just like to thank you for coming on, and uh, hopefully we can have you again sometime. Absolutely, man. Love, we can, uh, I can, uh, I like to talk, so man, we can talk, <laughs> we can talk all night, all about, especially about hunting, man, and uh, thank thank you guys again, and, and I just tell everybody to be safe this fall, man, and, and uh get their kids out or friends or family and introduce somebody to hunting, man, and uh, enjoy it. It's already, it's it's here, man. We were uh, getting ready for kill season and, and um, early goose season here is now up, up on us. So uh won't be uh, long and we'll be feeling some cold north wind days. All right. There he is. Uh, World Goose Calling Champion, Director of Marketing for Higdon Outdoors, Kelly Powers. Check him out at uh, HigdonDecoys.com. Thanks again, Kelly. Thank you, guys. So Dan, I don't know about you, but after talking with Kelly, I, I just, I listened back to that and there's just so much knowledge and so much information and so much experience that he shares. Um, you know, I just thought that was a really great conversation and it was great having him stop by the show. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And, you know, listening to the way he answers questions just brings up so many more questions that, you know, hopefully he'll join us in a, in another episode just to go, go back over that. Like you said, so much information and, and for someone to be so analytical when it comes to something like contest calling and breaking it down like that. Just, there's no wonder why he was, you know, the world champion. Like it's just, it's mind blowing to, to listen to what he went through. You know, I, I practice on my call a lot and I'm nowhere near the level of some of these competition callers, but you can just tell when you talk with a guy like him, 
that the command and the control that they have over their call is just a different level of what, you know, normal guys like me and you and, you know, other guys like that are, are doing in the field. So, um, you know, for those of those out there that, that don't think that competition calling and calling in the field parallels each other, you know, I, I got to believe that it does. I mean, if you if you're going to put me in a blind with somebody, you know, I'll take Kelly any day of the week and twice on Sunday for sure. Yeah, no doubt about that. I'd love to sit in a blind with him and um, I don't even know if I could focus on the birds just listening to him call. So it was, you know, a great interview. Like you said, tons of information. And it was just that's an awesome interview, I think. Yeah. And we encourage everyone to go out and support, you know, the things that Kelly is involved with. Uh, you know, he's obviously involved with Higdon Outdoors. He's got his uh, shop there that he talked about, Final Flight Outfitters. You know, he's involved with Under Armour. Uh, we encourage everyone to go out, support those, uh, you know, support those companies and, um, you know, keep supporting guys like Kelly that are doing, you know, good things in the waterfowl industry. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and transition here into our parting shot. So the parting shot this episode is going to be focused really on something pretty simple and uh, but gets overlooked quite a bit. And that's just everyday safety when you're out there in the field. You know, most guys don't re- realize that you're more likely to die from hypothermia or drowning, things of that nature in the field when you're waterfowl hunting rather than gunshot. So you got to make safety your number one priority when you're in the field, wearing life jackets, um, you know, ensuring your gun muzzles are pointed in the proper direction, maintaining your gun on safe, all of those sort of things. Um, if you've ever hunted with me, you know that I like to have a kind of a safety briefing in the beginning of the morning before the hunt, make sure everyone's on the same page as far as shooting lanes, you know, who's going to be calling shots, all of that kind of stuff. It's just important and it just shouldn't be overlooked. Um, have a plan if something happens, you know, we touched on this in another episode, but if you fall in the water or somebody has an issue in the field, make sure you've got emergency contact numbers on, on your, on your person, um, just ways that you can get help if you need it and you get caught in a tough spot. Um, same goes for your dog. Don't forget about your dog. They're just as important in, uh, making sure you're taking care of them. And always remember, you always have another day. There's always going to be another day to hunt. So just be safe. And that's going to do it for this episode of the HB Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. We'd like to thank Kelly Powers for joining the show. We'd encourage you guys to check everything out that he's got going on at Higdon Outdoors, Final Flight Outfitters. And uh, we'd like to thank you for tuning into the show. If you like what you hear, uh, check us out on Facebook, on iTunes. Uh, we'd love for you to fill out a review and uh, give us a rating. If you have questions, send us emails at info at hboutdoors.com or through our contact page on our website. And as always, we appreciate your time. For Dan, I'm Josh. Thanks for joining us. Take care. Take care.